is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. In 1978, Oregon saw an uptick of crimes against children, and panic swelled to an all-time high when two girls went missing within weeks of each other. Our first case today revolves around the disappearance of 12-year-old Anne Marie Ellenwood, who went missing during a March of Dimes walkathon in Corvallis. The second involves 11-year-old Stephanie Ann Newsom, who vanished while delivering newspaper advertisements near her home in Salem. Both girls were last seen walking on local paths, and in both cases, witnesses claim to have seen them with a similar man. Those of you who've listened to us for a while or know us outside of the podcast likely know that I was born and raised in Corvallis, Oregon. My dad moved to Oregon when he was accepted into Oregon State University, and my mom followed him out west shortly thereafter. Throughout my whole childhood there, I thought Corvallis was not only super safe, as I think most kids think about their hometown, but I was under that illusion for quite some time. Maybe it's because of that that I didn't always consider the consequences of some of my actions. For instance, I was a Girl Scout for a bit, and I sold Girl Scout cookies on my own door to door. Same. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. It's like I knew it was against the rules, but I got it done so much but faster. But I also knew all my neighbors. Oh, well, I was going into neighborhoods I didn't oh, know. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's against the rules. And I can remember on at least one occasion, I asked the homeowners if I could use their bathroom. <gasps> and they let me. And I did. <laughs> I just never considered that something bad would ever happen to me. As a kid, I talked to almost anyone. I went into a few neighbors' houses who I didn't know, and I really didn't think much of it. I would give personal details to adults when riding on planes to visit my grandparents. There was one situation where I had a friend who went to a babysitter's house after school every day, and her babysitter not only had a computer, but she had the Oregon Trail game. (gasps) And I think you can all understand the hype, right? Yeah. Considering I only got to play for like 15 minutes two to four times a year because my teacher happened to have the game in his classroom, when I was invited to that babysitter's house to go play with her, I had to go. As a latchkey kid, I was supposed to walk the two blocks home from school, let myself in, lock the door, and watch TV until my mom got home. But instead, I thought, I'm going to that babysitter's house, and I'll still get home before my mom. Did I consider leaving her a note just in case? Nah. Did I consider calling her at work to ask? No, I didn't. Well, after playing the game, we decided to go to the park, which was about a mile away. Anyway, needless to say, I got home several hours later than I was supposed to. And when I got there, I was greeted by my frantic mom and an angry police officer. He proceeded to give me the biggest talking to I had ever had in my life. He was yelling, spitting, and turning red. He pointed out that my mom had been crying because she thought I was abducted and would wind up dead in a ditch, and that several officers were spending their day driving around looking for me. And because I am who I am, or who I was as a kid... All I could think to do was antagonize him because during his rant, he let it slip that my mom told police I was wearing a white T-shirt. I was, in fact, wearing a yellow T-shirt with a Tweety Bird on it. And I also noted that I saw a cop car drive right past me on my way back from the park, so they weren't really looking all that hard. You're like, yeah, right, I was missing. (laughs) So he didn't like that, and he continued to yell at me some more until he truly believed I was sufficiently scared shitless. Anyway, I tell you this story because it was one of the first times I realized bad things could actually happen to kids like me because the reaction that him and my mom had was something I had never seen before. This was in the early 90s, so we were coming down from the stranger danger hoopla, but that wasn't something I recognized at the time, nor did I think would impact me in my hometown. 
Once that finally set in, I felt guilty. And while I still made a few bonehead decisions now and then, I was very much aware from that point on about missing kids. I was hyper fixated if they were featured in Unsolved Mysteries, if I saw a photo in the grocery store or on the back of coupons, I clocked it. I memorized their faces. While I was aware of abductions out in the world, I still thought Corvallis was the safest place because I don't remember anything bad actually happening there. It wouldn't be until I moved away for a couple of years and returned to go to Oregon State University that I realized Corvallis really isn't any different from other cities featured in the late night crime shows I would sneak in. Crime is there. It's estimated that one in 23 people in Corvallis will be a victim of crime. Now, that likelihood does decrease when you look at violent crime. But again, it's not any different from any major city. My first year at Oregon State University was in the fall of 2003. I transferred to the anthropology program after doing three years of community college. That following spring, a teenage girl was abducted from Corvallis. Her case impacted me greatly, as it did most of the people I knew. It could have been any of us. So it's not surprising that one of my first solo episodes for the podcast was focused on her case. In episode three, Minnesota Plates, I covered the case of Brooke Wilberger, who was abducted while cleaning lamps in the parking lot of the apartment complex her sister managed. Her killer was a man named Joel Patrick Courtney, who, thanks to the collaboration of police departments in different states, was apprehended before he could murder another girl. It took years, but he eventually led police to her remains, which were found on a remote road between the small towns of Blodgett and Wren, Oregon, along Highway 20, the highway that runs from Interstate 5 out to the Oregon coast. After covering Brooke's case, I started adding cases to my list of people who were associated with Corvallis. The next episode would be episode 25, Junkyard Shoes, which focused on Jerry Brudos, a serial killer who mutilated and killed at least four women and attempted to kill more. While the majority of his rampage on women took place when he lived in Salem, he went to high school at Corvallis High, my alma mater, and it just so happens he also lived in the same neighborhood as my stepdad. In episode 30, Nightmare Year, we discuss 17-year-old Richard Kitchell, a high schooler at Corvallis High who went missing in 1967. He was missing nine days before anyone seemed to notice. His body was later fished out of the Willamette River. It showed signs of homicidal violence. While it technically remains unsolved, we all have an idea who did it, a former CHS student Richard was seen at a party with. Another serial killer who spent time in Corvallis was Randy Woodfield, the I-5 killer, who was featured in episode 35. Woodfield's crimes escalated from indecent exposure to robbery to sexual assault and eventually to rape and murder. Over the duration of his rampage, he regularly stopped in Corvallis to commit crimes, one of the more severe being the time he invaded a home while two young sisters were there alone. He sexually assaulted them, but luckily left them alive. That wasn't the case for many of his future victims. I like how you started by saying you grew up feeling like Corvallis was the safest place. And you're like, and then I covered 90 cases of like <laughs> the worst crimes imaginable. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> and on to another. Episode 40, Complicit, was one of the harder cases for me to cover as we discussed the horrific long-term child abuse that three-year-old Carly Sheehan experienced at the hands of her mother's boyfriend, which was hidden by her own mother. Her father was falsely accused of physical abuse and desperately tried to protect her when he started to suspect that she might be experiencing abuse at her mother's home. But his cries for help were dismissed and disregarded multiple times until it was too late and she was found murdered. Unfortunately, the idyllic town I thought I grew up in is actually saturated with crime throughout its history. And like any other big city, it runs the gamut in complexity and severity. So what was more fitting than me covering another hometown case for our recent live show at Revolution Hall in Portland, Oregon in June of 2023? Only one thing more fitting. The topic was missing and murdered children, something you all know I'm very passionate about. Today, I'm going to share my live show case with you. It's centered on two missing girls and begins at the March of Dimes walkathon in Corvallis, Oregon in 1978. 
For anyone who hasn't heard of the March of Dimes, the organization was founded in 1938 by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Originally, it focused on combating polio, and later it expanded to support families of children with birth defects. Today, they provide education, resources, and financial support for families facing birth-related challenges of all types. Their funding primarily comes from hosting regular fundraisers, including the March for Babies Walkathon. I actually participated in one of these walkathons about a decade ago. It works like many fundraisers where you ask your friends and family to commit a pledge, you walk all day, and then gather the funds and turn it into the organization. On April 15, 1978, the March of Dimes walkathon took place in Corvallis in the downtown area. Like all walkathons, it followed a predefined path with checkpoints for participants to rest, use the bathroom, get water, or even catch a ride to another location. I'm going to talk about a portion of the path that day to give you some context. You can actually see images of this path in the episode blog on our website. The path that we'll be discussing is marked in blue on those images. Part of the walk was along First Street, which is parallel to the Willamette River to the east of downtown. This path went from the north to the south. Then the path moved towards the west and followed a bike path that runs along the south of downtown parallel to the Marys River. Participants would then make their way back north along 26th Street. At some point, they would turn towards the east to finish the loop, but what's of interest today is that south portion where the walk extends from the Willamette River along the Marys River. Among the many people participating in the walkathon that day was 12 year old Anne Marie Ellenwood, who planned to do multiple walks with her friends. Anne had been walking all day and was starting to get sore feet likely due to the new shoes she had bought a few weeks prior that didn't seem to be quite broken in yet. By the time she got to her third and final walk of the day, she had a bit of a limp. It was around 1 p.m. when her group walked from the first street path along the Willamette River towards the portion that runs along the Marys River. This area is known as a confluence, where two rivers join. That's where Anne was when she mentioned to her friends that her feet were really sore and suggested that she was going to rest a few minutes and she would catch up with them at the next checkpoint. That checkpoint was at Gill Coliseum, which was about a mile and a half away on the northward path along 26th Street. The group agreed and went on ahead without her. That was the last time any of her friends would ever see or speak to Anne again. Anne never arrived at the checkpoint, and eventually she didn't arrive at her afternoon paper route as expected. She had that paper route for over a year and never missed a delivery, nor was she ever late. When her family was alerted to her absence, they began to worry. And when she didn't make it home by 5 p.m., her parents went straight to the police department to report their daughter is missing. Police immediately searched the area where Anne's friends last saw her, but found nothing of interest. After speaking to some of the other people who were on the walkathon path around 1 p.m., the time she was last seen, they learned some new information. As it turned out, witnesses reported seeing a girl matching Anne's description talking to a man with a small dog. This was in Pioneer Park along the bike path wedged between the Marys River and the park's baseball fields. This location was roughly a half a mile west from where her friends had left her, which indicated that she had completed her rest and had likely resumed the path to meet up with her friends at the checkpoint. The witnesses described the man she spoke with. He had been standing next to a maroon truck with a teardrop-shaped trailer attached to it. He was Caucasian, stocky, with reddish-brown or sandy-colored hair. He had a mustache and a gruff voice. They knew this about his voice because one of the witnesses heard him tell the girl that he was the, quote, chief of police. When they looked back over at their direction, both him and the girl were gone. After speaking with more witnesses, police located another girl from the walkathon who reported being approached by a man with a Ford truck and a white trailer earlier that day. He was looking for help with his dog. When the man asked her to help him with the dog, she got a bad feeling about him but didn't want to upset him. So she told police she picked up the dog and tossed it through the open trailer door into the trailer, quickly walked away so he wouldn't continue to interact with her, which is a smart smart. move. Very, very bold. Yeah. 
Police believe the man she described was the same man witnesses had seen later in the day talking to Anne and that the man was attempting to abduct the girl using his dog as a ploy. With multiple witnesses describing what seemed to be the same man and vehicle, police felt confident he was the best lead they had, and they decided to circulate his description and wait for tips to pour in. However, four days into their investigation, little more was known and another girl went missing. On Wednesday, April 19, 1978, 11-year-old Stephanie Ann Newsom disappeared while she walked on a path near her home on Lavana Drive in Salem, Oregon. Stephanie lived a very short distance from Walker Junior High. In fact, the only thing separating her neighborhood from the school grounds was a small wooded area with several paths well-worn from the dozens of students living in the area. On the afternoon of the 19th, Stephanie used the path to deliver newspaper advertisements door-to-door. Her brother had a newspaper route, and that day he was unable to fulfill his duties, so Stephanie stepped in to make sure the delivery went uninterrupted. When she didn't arrive back home by 6 p.m., her parents went out to look for her. They searched the neighborhood and wooded area for about 30 minutes, and when they couldn't find her, they called police. A half hour after the report was made, police combed the same area. Dozens of people assisted in the search, and local officers stayed on past their shift in order to help locate Stephanie. Authorities believed she was abducted somewhere between her home at the top of the hill and the school grounds at the bottom, thanks to a witness that came forward. A junior high student reported seeing a girl matching Stephanie's description near the path closest to her home. The student witnessed her struggling with a white male in his late 20s who had a stocky build and light brown hair that fell just beneath his ears. Another witness claims to have seen Stephanie in the area sitting in the passenger seat of a dirty white 1961 to 1965 Chevrolet Bel Air. Despite the witness testimony and several days of searching, there were few leads. Then, on Thursday, April 27th, eight days after Stephanie's disappearance, a grim discovery was made near the Ankeny National Wildlife Preserve, about 10 miles south of Salem. Around 9.30 that morning, a local farmer named Jack Humphrey was preparing to fertilize his grass seed. As he made his way through his property, he spotted a pair of blue jeans and exposed skin beneath a bush. He didn't get much closer because he immediately knew what he was seeing. Instead, he turned away, promptly threw up, and then quickly retreated to find a phone to call police. Stephanie's body was taken to the state deputy medical examiner for autopsy. The results revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death using a narrow rope or similar material with a small diameter. Interestingly, before Stephanie's body was discovered, the police received a tip from someone at a local Salem bar. The tipster claimed that a man had been discussing Stephanie's case and predicted that she would be found dead in a field about eight miles south of Salem, without wearing her tights under her jeans. The lead was suspiciously close to how Stephanie was actually found, but when they followed up on it, it led to no new information. Although I never found who that person was, and it very well could be someone we learn about later, But it was interesting because, first of all, it's kind of an odd outfit. She was wearing tights under her jeans, I assume, because it was a little cold that day. But I don't think they ever announced that in the media. But I I do recall in one of the very first descriptions they post about her missing, they mentioned the tights. So it's not like it wasn't out there. Oh, okay. They just didn't dwell on it, and they didn't talk about it when they found her body. So somebody might have just been running their mouth at the bar like, oh, I heard something about her tights. or Yeah, like, and, and I mean... If you do think a kid gets kidnapped and you're kind of a true crime person, right. you're likely to think there's going to be some sort of sexual assault and you wouldn't find the tights. Like, I don't think that's a big leap. Yeah. Uh, but still, and it was it alarming. Had, if it hadn't been in the public, that'd be very different. Exactly. When it's time to decide what to eat, I feel like I have two major factors at play. How hungry am I? And do I have what is needed to make it? 
HelloFresh has answers for both of those questions. Sure, I could order some junk food or heat something up from a box, but in the same amount of time it would take to do that, I could be eating a freshly cooked, hot and healthy meal. In fact, HelloFresh has many menu options that are ready to eat in just 15 minutes or less. Utilizing HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients, I not only get to avoid the grocery store and forgetting that one thing off the list, but I will actually spend 25% less than if I had ordered delivery. I don't have the best focus or patience, so I really appreciate how each meal has easy to follow, foolproof instructions that allow me to bring out my inner chef. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RAIN16 and use code RAIN16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. As both investigations intensified, public panic started to grow. Prior to these two cases, troubling crimes against children had already started to raise questions on whether there was a single child killer or multiple perpetrators on the loose in Oregon. Just two months prior, in February, a 12-year-old girl with intellectual disabilities was abducted from a playground south of Corvallis by a man driving a white and red Volkswagen bus. She was raped and beaten, but managed to escape her attacker and hid in a bush in the William L. Finley National Wildlife Refuge until she could get help. Though she had difficulty communicating, she mentioned the words bad cop to first responders. Then in March, a 16-year-old girl named Karen Whiteside was attacked and killed while walking to a friend's home in Eugene. Her body was discovered at Fairfield Elementary School. She had been raped and strangled to death. Following the discovery of Stephanie's body in late April, Salem schools took precautionary measures such as locking their doors during school hours, only allowing children riding buses to be dropped off at their home or at school. Teachers and parents were reminded to discuss safety with children, emphasizing the avoidance of secluded areas and strangers. Officials also coached people on how to record license plate numbers when approached by a suspicious individual in a car, suggesting the use of sticks, rocks, or any available implement to scratch the numbers into dust or dirt if they didn't have pen and paper. Oh, that's clever. Isn't it? Despite increased vigilance, another incident occurred. In late April, a seven-year-old girl named Stacy Wilmoth went missing after using a restroom at West Gresham Grade School. Approximately 16 and a half hours later, Stacy was found cold and crying in a wooded area near the Columbia River. She had been severely beaten and was taken to the hospital to recover. Her classmates participated in a fundraiser, which resulted in over $4,000 to help Stacy's medical treatment and recovery. As local police departments focused on solving all of these cases, a much-needed lead in Anne's case emerged. After circulating the physical descriptions of the suspect and his vehicle around Corvallis and other nearby areas, several people came forward to say that it sounded a lot like someone they knew. The suspect in question was Earl Frederick Chambers, also known as Woody. A terrible nickname. I yeah. hate that nickname. Woody. He was born in December of 1935 in Los Angeles and relocated to the Lebanon Sweet Home area in 1976 and was working as a roofer. And of course, Woody the roofer had a criminal record with a history of sexual misconduct. In 1961, he was convicted of rape by force in California. In 73, he was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon. In May of 1978, the same month they learned who he was, he received probation for possessing a firearm as an ex-convict. A big, fat no-no. As I mentioned, multiple individuals came forward. They described Woody as having strawberry blonde hair, a mustache, and a distinctive gruff voice. Additionally, he drove a dark red truck and owned a teardrop-shaped trailer. It sounded like they had the right guy. This was enough compelling information for police, so they brought Woody in for questioning. When they did, they noticed that he had altered his appearance by shaving and dyeing his hair dark, which raised some suspicions. During the interrogation, Woody vehemently denied any involvement in Anne's disappearance, but that didn't deter police from keeping tabs on him. 
With a strong potential suspect emerging in Anne's case, authorities considered if this same individual could be connected to other cases, specifically Stephanie Newsom's abduction and murder. Witnesses' description of the suspect were strikingly similar, with the only discrepancy being the vehicle involved. However, that difference could potentially be explained. The people familiar with Chambers who came forward to inform authorities about him noted that in addition to his recent changes in appearance following Anne's abduction, he had also started driving a different vehicle, a white sedan resembling a Bel Air. On May 29, 1978, Corvallis police obtained a warrant to impound Woody's trailer. Additionally, they arranged a court date for him to testify about Ann's case before the Benton County Grand Jury. That was scheduled for Tuesday, June 6th. However, he failed to appear in court, prompting the police to issue an arrest warrant. Unfortunately, that warrant for his arrest would never be served because police discovered his body in his car at 3.30 p.m. on the same day he was scheduled to appear in court. He had committed suicide by inhaling carbon monoxide from his car's exhaust fumes. The vehicle was found parked on Middle Ridge Drive, a rural road outside of Lebanon where he was currently living. Shortly after his death, hair matching Ann's was found in his trailer, leading the Benton County District Attorney to officially designate Woody Chambers as the prime suspect in Ann's disappearance. The following day, Marion County District Attorney Gary Gortmaker made an announcement indicating a significant development in Stephanie Newsom's case. Many theorized that it was going to be revealed that the cases were officially linked. It was later revealed that Chambers had sought legal representation from a Salem law firm who declined to represent him, and one of the lawyers had to testify before the Marion County Grand Jury. Unfortunately, no further details were shared to the media at the time, and two weeks later, both Benton and Marion counties released statements asserting that the two cases were not linked. Hmm. And that was it. For many, many years, both cases went completely cold. They had a ton of circumstantial evidence linking Chambers to both cases, mainly Anne's case, but both cases, and outside of witness testimony, that's really all you had back then. I mean, unless there were blood evidence. Right. But these girls, uh, or at least Stephanie, was strangled. There was no blood. And there was no DNA analysis at the time. And hair analysis wasn't reliable. So I was honestly a little surprised that they didn't pursue closing the cases. Yeah. Because they had this this guy that was tied to them both and was dead. Like, I, as much as I hate to say that, like, what harm would that do? All right. Uh, if he's not but it's like how would you ever prove it unless somebody said i saw him with her you know um but it went cold for decades in 2005 investigators attempted to reinvigorate ann's case by conducting dna analysis on the hair that was found in his trailer they had hoped that with the advanced techniques they now had they could match it definitively to ann's hair But unfortunately, the results were inconclusive and both cases, again, remained cold. In 2013, a retired Salem police officer, Sergeant J.R. Miller, took on the task of attempting to solve the cases. He thoroughly reviewed both case files and reached out to surviving witnesses. One of those witnesses was the girl that had been approached by a man looking for help with his dog. In the case file, Miller discovered that she had previously dismissed Chambers as the man that approached her. But in his reviewing of that information, he uncovered a significant revelation. It turned out that the police had shown the girl a photo of Chambers after his appearance had been altered during questioning. Oh, my gosh. Leading her to mistakenly deny his identity as she was looking for the telltale sign of strawberry blonde shaggy hair. However, when shown a photo of Chambers with his mustache and lighter hair from before the alteration, she promptly identified him even after all of those years. When we review cases, we often look at old newspaper clippings, and apparently that's what cold case investigators do too. Miller took to the archives and discovered an article mentioning Chambers' attempt to seek legal representation. I saw that same article, which was revealed during the Marion County Grand Jury proceedings. He found the lawyer who spoke to the grand jury and realized that he had disclosed to them 
that Chambers had admitted his responsibility for both abductions, strongly implying their murders as well. So why in the hell were the cases open for so long? Marion County District Attorney Gary Gortmaker apparently did not utilize that crucial information to close Stephanie's case, nor did he share it with Benton County. Or if he did, they didn't say anything. Cool. So, you know, some classic old timey police work bullshit <laughs> failing people, you know, the usual. Yeah. J.R. Miller, with his extensive cold case investigation, has officially solved both cases. He is confident that Chambers was indeed the primary suspect and even met with both Anne and Stephanie's parents in 2014 to officially close their cases. However, there is currently no known connection between Chambers and the other abductions and unsolved murder mentioned earlier. Despite former Detective Miller's assertion that the cases are solved, Anne Marie Ellenwood's body has yet to be found. She's still listed in NamUs with the hope that her remains will eventually be located. The case of Karen Whiteside, the 16-year-old who was murdered in Eugene, has limited information. In 2005, two detectives dedicated their spare time, all that spare time yeah. they have. So much. So much of it. But they, they spent that time investigating her case. KVAL aired her story for them. And because of that, new tips emerged from the public. One particular tip led them to re-examine the crime scene photos where they discovered an overlooked item. Some theorize it was a murder weapon. However, even after all these years, there is no current news on whether that item provided DNA or any other clues that could help solve the case. As of today, her murder remains unsolved. Mm. There was another body discovered that leads us to question Chambers' involvement. In 1978, the remains of 22-year-old Elizabeth Ann Moosler were discovered in the wooded area near Green Peter Dam. She had been missing since 1977, and it just so happened that she went missing from the Lebanon area where Chambers had lived at the Mm. time. So while many speculate that he had a hand in ruining more lives than just Stephanie and Ann's, without DNA, we'll likely never know. I will give credit however little it may be to say at least they didn't just bundle all these cases together have the guy take his life and then go oh yeah he for sure did all this and we know it because we've seen that too where we have cases and it's like um the family's fighting to get the actual killer in because you just decided to pin it on this other guy and i think they did eliminate him because he didn't have access to a red and white volkswagen bus Mm. and in the girl in gresham's case she had described him as like a little bit older, thin and olive skinned. Mm. So they could say, OK, that's not him. But, right. you know, the public was like, oh, my God. Right. What's worse? Multiple killers or like one. No one knew what to think. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. And just, well, I guess you are. What's the word? Un- unscrupulous. If you're willing to take a child's oh, life. Yeah. But on top of that, to not at least let the family find. I get that you're hiding your crimes, but to I not know. let them know where their baby is like laying somewhere, you know, it's just and I, I it's very unlikely um, we'll ever find her feeling. And the area is so wooded. I mean, mm-hmm. we have so much protected land out there. Yeah. He clearly knew his way around. He was from the Lebanon area and, and knew what spaces be wouldn't be gone to. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's really sad. But I also have this extreme disappointment with that grand jury proceeding. Like Mm -hmm. this lawyer is saying he admitted this. How was that? not? How is that possible to get a confession? And then, well, I mean, he was dead by then. But still, like, yeah, that that would have been enough if it's a a lawyer who has sworn to the Mm -hmm. court. Like you would take that testimony at face value. So, yeah. Uh, There's something was going on there because that just seems so fishy that both counties would have a major screw up. One Marion County being not telling people that Mm -hmm. he admitted it and Benton County showing a picture after someone was arrested or brought in for questioning Mm -hmm. when every witness described him having light colored hair. Yeah. Like what what little dum dum did you send (laughs) to do that ID? 
some or, newbie or to think that that wouldn't be that much of a of like oh well if this was the guy they'll be able to tell it's like no i've had moments where i'm like oh my god if something happened i would not be able to tell you this person i just spoke with at well, the counter or and whatever the pictures will be in our blog you will see a picture of a light-haired version of him with a little dog sitting in a red truck and then the dark hair version totally different people oh my god totally different people uh, so I don't blame her. And I. Think, oh, yeah. For, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah, like, how could they possibly think they should have known better? Like if you have four or five witnesses all saying sandy colored hair with a little dog, why wouldn't you be like, oh, well, okay, here's be- a photo of that exact thing. And his friend saying, yeah, he usually has blonde hair, but he dyed it yeah. recently. You know, after that little girl went missing. Yeah, oddly after enough, you guys came snooping around. I mean, it just seems so weird. We've convicted people on less bullshit than that. Yeah. That I just I'm flabbergasted i think what always gets me is that these people are in that profession and they see this every day yeah and if you are so burnt out that you're just like oh whatever here's a picture fine it's the guy or it's not if you're to that point you need to find something else take a break yeah you are dealing with people on the worst day and people are going to react different or people aren't yeah. they're going to be intimidated coming into the room we were watching the making of a sex scandal on hbo and they're interviewing kids about potential abuse and they have a ranger come in with a big old badge and a big old gun and sitting with the kid and the kid's like um yeah it's... you know to not think about those things of like this is new for me i thought uh-huh. of that with getting my hysterectomy i was like hey i get this is old news and you're going to do this 10 times you today. have to approach it i've empathy. never done it <laughs> It's my I, only time. That reminds me of my conversation with Lindsay Wade. And mm. I had asked her, what kind of training do people get to talk to a parent uh, about a pair of children's underwear to get an ID? Like, what kind of training goes into that? And she said at the time, none. Yeah. Things have changed. We Because you don't know what you don't know until you know. Oh, right, right. Right. So then you learn. And I get that. But it's these are you're right. The darkest moment of people's lives has to be approached with empathy because, yeah, you might not be feeling anything, but they are and you have to navigate that. You ha- and there are professional people out there who know how to talk to rape victims, who know how to talk to parents. I was of talking about children. that the other day, how we should have instead of police force, we should have like a third party that just deals with sexual assaults. Well, in and some places like, are prof- trying it. Yeah. So I- or it's like a professional and, and probably victims themselves because they would understand what to say or not say or ask especially people of color because yes. putting a police officer in a room with them may yes. not be the right thing to do so yeah we got to uh, get smarter about it and have empathy i mean in everything yeah. we do you have to yeah, have empathy exactly exactly to the, to the bitch ass waitress who says something mean to you like you don't know what she just dealt with <laughs> exactly <laughs> i try to think that a lot <laughs> i had a really okay so as you guys know <laughs> i have an elbow infection right now and i yes. had to go to urgent care yesterday and i came in 20 minutes before closing and listen i get it but i was in extreme pain i don't go to the doctor yeah it's I an emergency to. room this gal at the front desk, I don't know how I held my tongue. I just let her. She's She was getting mad. She's like, oh, I just shut down my computer. I'm like, it is not 8 o'clock. Yeah, what? Turn that computer back. And she's like, oh, I'm not frustrated with you. I'm frustrated at me. And I'm like, why are you frustrated? Like, And don't tell me you're frustrated. This is why I think everyone needs to walk in other people's shoes yeah. in a different profession or like shadow them because the level of stress that you feel as like a front desk person mm-hmm. is a lot different than like an ER doctor mm-hmm. or like someone saving lives or you know it you just have to have some perspective I've thought while. of that like I wish there was a TV show like undercover boss but just swapping professions yeah where someone could be like hey my friend is always a dick to servers I would like him to have to be a server for a yeah, day yeah because and then I, he doesn't be like Oh, I do think people who have been servers have like a totally new empathy for Mm -hmm. that. And I appreciate every job I've had for that reason. Yeah. And when I am at my most frustrated at work, I will sit back and go, well, you know, I'm not I didn't just lose a patient on a table like you have to have perspective. And we need to consider that when we're interacting with people, especially in their lowest moments. So, I mean, I really think about that a lot with these cases. But. Yeah. Well, and, and the size of it. If you're showing the wrong picture, you could be letting a killer go that could hurt more people. Absolutely. Like, give it that and gravity did. and the weight that it should have and not just another day at the office. And had we got him in prison sooner, mm-hmm. he may still be alive and we may have been able to get DNA and solve yeah. a bunch of cases. So we have to think smart mm-hmm. into the future but so it's unfortunate but the 70s were a wild time they as we certainly know. were and Hey-o. i don't want to deter anyone from moving to corvallis because i will <laughs> say it's a wonderful town to raise a family and it's gorgeous it's great but we have to remember 
nothing's like it is on TV. There is yeah. murder and mayhem everywhere. What do you think it is about Corvallis? Because I know like Lane I-5. County. Yeah. It's so close out. to the I-5. It's one of the biggest cities. Like Because Lane, Lane County next... has so many missing people, like way higher it's than It's heavily average. wooded and you have a lot of highways. So one, yeah. we have the I-5 going north to south, right? That's a big getaway to get out of state. But we also have Highway 20. Now, I mentioned uh, if you look at the map, you're going to see Highway 20 is where their path kind of went underneath. Mm. Now, that was also the same highway Brooke Wilberger's body was found on. It's very heavily wooded and a lot of private land. So you can't just go search it right. if there's a missing person. A lot of Republican land, yeah. I'll say. And I wonder, too, if the college element adds to oh, yeah. more. One, on one it's hand, it's easy to go missing. Exactly. On one hand, you have kids that are maybe not making their best choices while out on their own for the first time, like everybody does. And you have people that know that they're there. Now, I will say we don't have a ton of missing people there, but there is a lot of like crime on campus. Like during mm. the Brooke Wilberger case, they looked at a a suspect who had been stealing women's underwear from the oh, right. laundry rooms and sneaking into their bedrooms. Intimate and garbage. Stuff. Intimate garbage. That stuff goes kind of under the radar or it's not escalated. And the day Brooke went missing, another girl, he tried to get mm-hmm. another girl. Mm-hmm. And because the wires got crossed, it maybe wasn't escalated like it could have been. Right. And it's a big place. It's a big place. Has a lot of wooded areas. It's really close to a lot of highways, and I think that's the issue. And there are yeah. so many. And I'm going to get into them in some of my cases later this year. There are so many missing gals in that coastal yes. Highway 20 area. For so, my uh, old case, something very sharp. The detective I interviewed told me to watch a thing on YouTube about Highway 20. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to cover those cases. Yeah, so it's been on our list for a while. Yeah, it has. Speaking of our old episodes, oh, we yeah? had some people going, "Where are the old episodes?" We took them down from our main feed mainly because we felt like they weren't the best representation of where we are now in our podcast and you know, when you when I go listen to a new podcast, I usually hit the first one available. Right. And I would hate to lose people because they can't see our growth. So we we haven't totally taken them away. Just a little right? house cleaning. Just a little house cleaning. You can get them on YouTube for free and on our Patreon for one dollar. One dollar a month will get you every episode we have. Yeah. So it was just some light housekeeping. You know, we've got our studio sound down really well. Our writing has improved. So we were just like, those are those are getting a little dusty. We just moved to the side, but, but they're, they're all there. still available. Yep. And uh, ready to be listened to. And the ones I mentioned today, I'm going to link in the blog. So if you want to go check out those older episodes, oh, perfect. you can. How helpful. That's really nice of you. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes. Is hoopla okay to say? <laughs> I don't know. I Can you look so. it up just in case? You have me wondering. It's French from hoopla hoopla for upsy daisy. Okay, so we were coming down from all that stranger danger hoop <laughs> danger 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 hoopla. Danger. After doing three years of communication, first solo cases for the podcast. Yeah, that's how you say podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're going with today. At I least. pulled. I pulled one of the. That doesn't sound uh-huh. right. For anyone who hasn't heard of the March of Dimes, the Oregon... I've never heard of that. Part of the walk along. Walk along? Walk along. Part of the walkathon. Nope. Part of the walk was along. I did oh, intend that. Oh, tricky. Silly me. Just don't get all your, your phrases from Rudyard Kipling. I'm usually <laughs> very... Who has a nose whistle? Is that you, Joshua? My nose rarely whistles. It's too small. My nose holes are so small. I have to, oh, I have to dig for my gold. My nose is so I have to dangy. dig for gold multiple times a day so I can breathe is all. Yeah, oh. and you have to use a toothpick to do it. Oh. They're so tiny, like, like Lord my, Voldemort. Like my petite ah. little ear holes. I have little ear holes, too. Ugh. One upper. I have to use the child size earbuds. Because I'm just so dainty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm petite. Except for my butt. <laughs> and my gut. That's all that matters. In my Thick brain. Butt. <laughs> Is that Tom Cruise? <gasps> Maverick! <laughs> I need a big boy. I need a big boy. Big boy. <laughs> you know that song? <laughs> no. Oh, I love that song. <laughs>
It's comfy. Oh, because it's a TikTok trend. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's comfy season. You know what that means. I want a big boy. A big boy. You've never heard that? Oh, my God. You got to look it up. It's funny. People will. <laughs> people did like a trend of showing their their plus size boyfriends. Oh, with fun. It. But then um, people got carried away and were showing like gym bros. And they're like, you don't get no, the song. That's not You're not it. understanding. No one wants to cuddle with your abs. Mm -mm. Ouchie. Just remember, there's Arby's on the other oh, side yes. of this for you. Or a blizzard. One or the other, not both. Maybe a roast beef blizzard. <laughs> it's gravy instead of ice cream. Oh, my. Actually. <laughs> it's mashed potatoes and gravy. Oh, okay. That'd be good. But warm, <laughs> not cold. Oh, my God. I would eat a, a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket size <laughs> one of those. What do you mean Thanksgiving blizzard? Like, like a mashed potatoes, piles. turkey. Oh, yeah, put it like all in. how I do in my bowl. Yeah. Mm. Some okay. Corn. Mm. Decorative, decorative Thanksgiving corn. Oh, I, how dare you? I'm more of a green beans gal myself. <laughs> Harvest corn. Yeah, me too. My green beans gal. I love that. Green bean casserole is my favorite thing at Thanksgiving. I know it's people who judge me for it. Wow. But no, but you make a good one. I'm a stuffing I do make boy. a good one. And I also like to make Alicia her mm -hmm, meat free gravy. stuffing and, and gravy. Stuffing. Mm -hmm. Oh, how sweet. Mm -hmm, she always did. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. The following day, Marion County District Attorney Gary Gortmaker made an announcement in <laughs> you motherfucker. I got through that sentence. You you knew you needed a buffer for us. <laughs> Gortmaker? Gort yeah, that was right. Fuck you, Emily. <laughs> Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production written, hosted, and edited by Josh McCullough, Emily Rowney, and Alicia Holland. Feel free to email us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. For as little as a dollar a month, you can subscribe on Patreon to get exclusive access to ad-free and older episodes. For only $5, you can access Patreon-exclusive episodes and content. For more of us, be sure to follow on all the socials, listen to Josh and Alicia on their other show, Always Be My Sisters, and follow Emily on TikTok at m underscore murderintherain. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>